Hi, welcome to Epicenter. I'm Sebastian Couture and I'm here with Sunny Agarwal. And today we're going to be speaking with Alex Masmesh, or as we like to call him in France, Alex Masmejean. And uh, he's going to be telling us all about uh, Showtime and we're going to be talking about NFTs. We'll be diving deep into everything that's going on with NFTs right now and also probably talk about the Alex token as well. Uh, but first, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors for today's episode. Paraswap just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap, and it comes with a new gas token that can cut your fees by up to 50%. Paraswap is also now multi-chain, and it's expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. You can start trading at paraswap.io slash epicenter. We're also sponsored by Solana, a next-generation blockchain with lightning's fast blocks and uh, fees less than a cent per transaction. Scalability is perhaps the single biggest challenge preventing crypto from becoming the backbone of the world's financial system. And today, Solana might be the best option we have. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. And we're also sponsored by Exodus, an easy to use wallet which supports hundreds of assets and has native apps for all platforms, including iOS and Android. And it's a non, uh, fully non custodial wallet and they're firm believers in the not your keys, not your coins mantra. Go to exodus.com and give it a try. Alex, thanks for joining us. Uh, we've been trying to plan this for like a long time and I'm happy that it's finally happening. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for having me. So you were uh, you were in Paris recently, and you uh, just arrived back in, in San Francisco. How does it feel to be back? I've just been in the U.S. for like four four days, I think. Uh, yeah, super excited. Uh, it was a long journey, and yeah, it's kind of like closing the loop on the Alex token, which was made to move to the U.S. Um, and so, yeah, that was uh, really exciting to see this ending. And so now I've got my startup, and I need to focus on it like a hundred percent. So yeah, feels great. Cool. Uh, I think I think Sunny will be disappointed to hear that Alex is no longer a thing because he was earlier saying, "I want to know what my Alex tokens are worth." <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, let, let, we'll we'll talk about Alex in, in just in a second. So, for those who don't know you, you know, tell us a little bit about your journey uh, and how you fell into the into the crypto rabbit hole. Sure. Um... So I got into crypto uh, in like 2017, uh, frankly, because I could. I, I feel like the, the bars of entry to crypto as a European, because you know, you're know you also French, Seb, uh, it's like it's easier than other industries to enter, especially at the start of my career. And so it just made sense that I could enter this field, which also happened to be extremely high impact on society in the next 10 years. And so extremely high potential, low bars to entry for me was a no brainer. In 2017, I got interested in it, didn't do anything about it. And um, roughly like at the start of 2019, I started reading a ton more about crypto and I started being active on Twitter, like mid 2019. And there's this guy called Peter Pan from Meta Cartel, who basically like gives me money out of just one tweet of mine saying, Hey, I'd love to go to Berlin blockchain week. And that's how I got to like meet the crypto community. Like basically Peter Pan flew me out, uh, in Berlin and, um, and there, um, I learned a bunch about you know the Ethereum uh, ecosystem, uh, all the things that you cannot do without crypto, uh, DAO, DeFi, NFT, um, and then yeah, fast forward like I do a project called Rocket about NFT again. Um, then COVID happens, we have to reset everything, and you know think about like what what I should do next. I do the Alex token as like a way to crowdfund my life so that I can you know spend some time finding a co-founder, searching for my next big project, moving to SF. And fast forward to now, I've done all of those things and I just moved to SF and I just started Showtime like five months ago. And uh, it's been a crazy, crazy journey so far. Like people think like backpacking is crazy, but like starting a startup is insane. Yeah. So I'm excited. A little, little flashback there to reset everything, uh, <laughs> which we, yeah. we co-organized uh, in the beginning of COVID, which seems like such a long time ago. And it, it feels like such a different time now. Like, I don't know, man, like it, it was, um, yeah, it was great, but it, it just feels like such a different time from, you know, just whatever it was like, it was like 12, 11, 13 months ago. Yeah. So you, you launched this, the, the Alex token. I think like a lot of people know you from, from the Alex token. What was the inspiration for the Alex token? And like, why did, why did you choose to do this? Um, so actually like, you know, going back a little bit from the time where Peter Pan gave me money for a tweet. At the end, Peter Pan was like, hey, like, this is a bear market. Can you pay me back? Like, you know, we're not that wealthy. Um, and so we decided to tokenize my debt. Uh, it was very easy. It was 1,500 Alex Masmej loan 2019 tokens on Etherscan. 
each representing $1. And I was basically going to give 10% interest on top of the principal a year later. And so with, we do this, like, you know, it's just in, in between us. But Roll, which at the time is like the only social token issuer, like reaches out to me and say, hey, like, you know, uh, this is crazy. Like we've been trying to convince people to create their own token uh, for a while now and you've done this yourself. Like, why don't you do like a more general purpose token rather than just a debt token with us? And I said, okay. And so we do the Alex token. At the time it was, yeah, end of 2019, but no one really cared because I was not particularly like known in the community or, you know, there was no use case I could attach to it. Uh, it was like one hour equal like one token or something or 10,000 tokens, but, you know, no demand for my time at the time. Um, and so, yeah, fast forward COVID where I'm like forced to, you know, do something that uh, gets me out of Paris, gets me to do a startup. And that was the only thing I was like vaguely known for in the community that was like a little bit fun. And yeah, I happened to be speaking at like um, ECC for a conference about personal tokens. That was the last ever conference before COVID conferences like became remote. Um, and so I was like, yeah, like let's announce something. Let's crowdfund because honestly, I had no money at the time. Uh, it was Paris. I got cut my small side income that I got from uh, like a marketing project in the space. That's about it. And so they said to crowdfund $20,000. And yeah, like I, I feel like it resonated with people because it was so simple to understand. It's kind of like the NFT space today. We can talk about it later. Like it's so simple, the digital art, uh, you know, like you buy something and you invest in someone with the Alex token and Credit Coin and most recently BitCloud. So all of those concepts are very consumer facing and easy. And so that's probably why it did resonate. And then I kind of used it for the remaining of the year to do some uh, small projects uh, that we can talk about as like many small things with it. It was quite funny. So that like uh, initial loan that you did, I remember, I think the first time you and I actually got in touch was, you know, I think we were talking about like under collateralized lending and things like that. Uh, and so I remember you were working on a project as well. Like you, I remember you have, I remember, I think you have like a pretty like really nice blog post about under collateralized lending that I think I've like linked people to multiple times and stuff. So uh, what was that sort of like, uh, what, what were you building with that? That's so interesting. It's like, we don't actually talk about this that much about this period of time, which was when I was in between Meta Cartel and uh, the Alex token, I basically realized there is only over collateralized lending in DeFi. Uh, you know, Maker is great, but it's not very capital efficient. And I realized why not do, you know, unsecured lending, which is, I think, 99% of the market of loans. Like, no one does over collateralized mm -hmm. loan, but whales and margin traders. And so I did this blog, I did this, I do this thread on Twitter that does really well. Camila Russo from The Defined contacts me to do an article. I write an article about it with like Maple Finance, um, I think Union Protocol as well. Uh, there's also this, this startup, uh, which I forgot the name of, uh, I think Teller Finance, because they rebranded, that's why I was confused. Uh, Teller Finance, which is backed by 16Z, cool, unsecured lending um, platform. And so from those learnings, I was like, Actually, like one way to have co over collateralized lending not be too, uh, you know, too friction uh, inducing would be to have NFTs as collateral. And so from this, I saw Rocket, which just is like a Moloch DAO, so like a, a basic DAO of, of lenders that could basically decide, okay, we'll fund uh, X amount of money against this piece of art that we are using, a little bit like a pawn shop. A decentralized pawn shop was the idea behind Rocket. It didn't do too well, honestly. I think now there's like more tries with NFT and DeFi liquidity, like NFTX mm -hmm. or like DeFi NFT charge particles. There's like an, a few other projects, but I felt the market was kind of too tiny. I don't think it was my big startup idea. So I hold off on it. Uh, COVID happened. I do the Alex token and now on to Showtime. So that was a funny period of my time, though, because I think the main reason, the main learning for me was like, I don't think I'm very good at DeFi. I'm better at consumer products. DeFi requires a financial background. I didn't have that financial background. And so it, but it was still a very good learning experiment. Like I just know a lot about DeFi because of this. So, yeah. The Alex token, like what, what is it? So for context, I, I, I have a lot of Alex token and I think I'm like one of the larger LPs of, of Alex token, but I, so what what do I, what is my Alex token? I, you know, I just treated it as a uh, 
prediction market on you, but like, what, what does that mean? Like, what, what do I get by holding this Alex token? Right. So it, it makes sense like today because I'm focused on my startup, like the Alex token is a bit like a meme, meme coin. So mm-hmm. like the only concrete usage you can get today is if you hold over 5,000 Alex, not the LP tokens, the actual ERC20, you get to be in the Alex Ivory Tower, which is like the uh, assertive group chat where like a bot is checking every minute whether you hold those tokens. The minute you sell, you are kicked out of the group chat. Mm-hmm. So that's like the only use case, which is basically like there's no real use case uh, for today, for people who buy today on Uniswap. But the Alex token, so started as one hour of my time, didn't really do that. Then did the Alex token um, income sharing agreement, which was what was mm-hmm. used to fundraise the $20,000. It was 30 people. So the rest, there's right now 600 holders the, the, all the holders don't have this, but the 30 people who gave me together $20,000, they are getting a net drop every quarter for the next three years of my income. Um, and, and so that was the use case for them. And then what I did a few months later was something called Control My Life, where um, it was this token-based voting via simply signing. So there was no gas fees to basically just signal like a vote um, on my daily life habits. Um, so like people could choose if I was mm-hmm. going vegan or like running three miles a day every day, or if I was to only live solely off Bitcoin, or if I was going to wake up at 6 a.m. And people chose three miles a day. And so I did run all of those three miles a day. It sounds like a very, you know, like superficial experiment. But Austin Griffiths and I, when we did this, although it, it sounds like a joke, it actually partly inspired Snapshot Labs, which basically is like this engineer from Balancer, uh, the AMM, who was like, wow, like this is actually like pretty useful for like signaling voting without gas. And I guess these are crazy. And so actually Alex was one of the very first Snapshot Labs projects because of this. Mm. Uh, so anyway, so like, although it was mostly like a gimmick, like a joke, it still helped like, you know, push the space forward. At least that's like how I portray it. So I feel good about this. So when you're looking for a flight, you go to a flight aggregator to see all the different places where you can buy the flight to get all the options and make sure you get the best price for your travel plans. And when you're making a DeFi swap, just do the same and use Paraswap. It beats the market prices across all the major DEXs because it aggregates them and thanks to their network of professional market makers, you get zero slippage on your trades. So they just pushed a huge update that's even faster, more liquid, thanks to a brand new algorithm. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. So go and check it out. Give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. How does the, uh, the, the, the income airdrop work? Like, is, is that that you... Is that sort of like handled by a smart contract where your income has to come through like a certain address and then it automatically gets gets distributed as an airdrop or is that dividends basically? Uh, so no, like there is no enforcement on chain. I think this was like the main backlash. Uh, there was two main backlash of the Alex token. Um, and so yeah, one of them is like, this is not un- enforceable. Uh, this is uh, only my reputation is a collateral uh, kind of uh, where no, like I have to, you know, send by email. I have the emails of everyone saying, hey, this is the income I made. I don't even show my tax returns or, th- or stuff like this. It's just like, I tell them that and, and um, yeah, that, that was basically like the way we went and I use like, you know, a nail drop, like multi-send or something uh, to, to send it and okay. that, that's about it. And do you actually do this? Like, do you send people? I do this. Income? Yeah, I do this every three months and I've done this like four or five times now because it's been a year. So I, I think I've done this four times so far and I'm going to continue. And yeah, also like my income is in fiat. Um, and so actually like this very problem is partly what inspired Showtime. Because I was like, you know, all the backlash around the Alex token not being enforceable and being like an ICO uh, actually makes sense. Like, I'm not saying this is uh, a, a wrong critic. Like, this is the truth. And so I was like, okay, like what sort of income can someone make on chain that is a little bit more consumer facing than just, you know, like software development, software development with Gitcoin or stuff like this. And it turns out that being an NFT artist or a creator is the first time you can have, you know, income on chain going through you. And so we can use applications to redirect, like maybe super fluid finance, 
which is like a project that that helps like uh, do like ERC twenty distribution or like mirror splits more recently, which is splitting mm -hmm. for like NFT publications. So all of those things are possible with NFTs, and so I realized this, and this was kind of the premise of Showtime. So, so why did you do it only for the like sort of initial bios of Alex instead of like uh, doing as this sort of like ongoing with like cur every whoever is currently holding Alex at any given moment? I think I, sh I, I, I honestly like looking back, I, I should have done it that way. Uh, I think one reason was first I didn't know this was going to succeed. Like I, I just did a bunch of experiments in, in the past four or five months. It, it wasn't really thought out really well. Um, and another reason is that it, it seems a bit more complex. You have to introduce some tokenomics about like, so what do I do? Do I like buy a bunch of Alex tokens and then burn them? Is that the mechanic to uh, increase the price? I wasn't sure about the exact tokenomics and it was just so much easier to do like a Google form. Uh, at the time I was really going for maximum simplicity and, and making sure people just understand it. But yeah, like I think it was confusing over time to know that, you know, uh, this wasn't, a, a, an income sharing agreement for everyone. Also, one thing is like diluting my income, which is like if there's 600 holders, like I'm not a multimillionaire. Like I'm not going to give a substantial amount of money if there's that many holders. So keep it 30 is best. Mm -hmm. And also, um, also just like being conscious of securities laws and stuff like this. I did this outside of the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, and so keeping it to 30 people with a very tiny amount is also something that I like because, you know, it's an experiment. I don't want to you know, get people uh, losing money and, and I just want to make sure that everything is fine. And I'm confident with the role team and the legal team and everything, but also making very tiny was also nice as well from a legal perspective. How do they, ta what kind of income does this get taxed at for the, for the token holders? So uh, it's so funny because I'm a French resident and I paid my taxes in 2020. I had to talk to like one of the most notable like French uh, crypto accountant and he was like so surprised like he was like like yeah like this is such a weird use case I think we text <laughs> it as uh, I think I know who this is yeah Alexandre it's it's another Alex <laughs> um, and so like what we did is it was seen as free like as like a airdrop this is how we did it which basically meant like maximum taxes but like I was I was happy with this you know like I didn't want to have any problems and it was free money in a way, although I'm giving my income later on, like I, I still want it to be, and French taxes happen to be quite high, uh, 30%, mm. <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. So like, will Alex holders like be like, is, is it like integrated at all at the showtime at, in any way, like into your current project? So I get this question asked a lot, like, I'm not sure I can answer, I cannot answer any link with showtime. I, I, I mean, what I can say, though, is like I'm going to try my best to reward the Alex holders because mm -hmm. honestly, it's, it's actually pretty insane how Alex did to my career. Like before Alex, I was this, you know, random guy at conferences, uh, just like with big dreams. But like the Alex bridged a huge, huge gap here. And so those people are partly responsible for my success. It's kind of like I created my own Teal Fellowship for myself. Uh, for those who know about like the tech, you know, young people. And so like, it's, it, it was really helpful. And so it, it seems like they deserve some things, but like, I cannot legally say anything. I don't even know myself. Uh, it, will there be any links with Showtime? But we're going to, I'm, I'm going to maybe try, but like, I cannot say, I, I really cannot say. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, Showtime then. So yeah, what is Showtime to start off with? Sure. So Showtime is a NFT social media uh, to discover and showcase uh, digital art. Uh, that's like the current version, uh, because obviously like in the NFT space, NFT art and collectibles is the main, the main thing today. And so we decided why not build a platform that reads every single marketplaces. And instead of buying and selling, you can like, comment, share, and do all a bunch of things that basically Instagram does. So I think a lot of people describe us as like the Instagram for NFTs. And I think that's a, that's a fair comment. It's like, you know, NFTs are basically revolutionizing social media and is like a new way of displaying social media content and creating social media content online. So why display them solely as financial assets? Um, especially as NFT prices are really high, gas fees are really high right now. Uh, most people just want to see them like Instagram. Like you don't buy on Instagram all the pictures and photos like advertisers do, 
but that's like a very small persona. And so, yeah, we just wanted to have a kind of like this digital museum gallery, social media, uh, you know, Instagram slash Pinterest style uh, platform that basically sees all the NFTs from Ethereum. Let's get to our sponsor, Solana. Now, this is a special ad for me to read because I've been a deep supporter of this project since meeting the Solana team back in 2018. I invest personally in the project and my company, Course One, is super deeply involved in the Solana ecosystem, including running the biggest validator. So what's so cool about Solana? Well, we all know that scalability is the single most important issue facing the blockchain industry today. And the Solana blockchain is an amazing solution for it. The network supports thousands of transactions per second with 400 millisecond block times and over 500 validators. The special thing about Solana is also that it's not a sharded blockchain. It's a single blockchain hyper-optimized for performance. So that makes it really easy to maintain composability between all of the apps on Solana so that they work together seamlessly now and forever. The Solana ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace and it's a great place to build your project or just get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. So maybe like we should like uh, step back a little bit and talk about like just what is going on with NFTs and like, you know, before we dive into like how, what Showtime wants to do with them. So, you know, I think we've done, you know, maybe this is our like third or fourth episode now. Like I think we, we did our first one with Al, uh, Alex from Rarible a couple uh, months ago. And then we had the guy who did the uh, Friends with Benefits tokens and stuff. And so I know. But there, really? couple, yeah, yeah. You know, from your perspective, you know, I think maybe you have a different take uh, view of it than, you know, for example, the Rare World founders do. So what do you see as this like current, what's happening with NFTs and why has there been this like sudden hockey stick growth in the entire NFT space in the last eight months? Yeah, like what, what I noticed, uh, which was like the data that was backing the rational for building Showtime was in July 2020, the NFT space started going exponential uh, in terms of volume. And I think one reason is that basically, like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, almost no one cares about technology or finance, uh, but everyone cares about social media. Everyone cares about art and culture in all its form. And so it happens to be digital art because that's like the most economically viable option right now because art is, it can be expensive. Uh, you know, you don't buy art every day. And so it fulfilled all the things that crypto uh, with two days limitations uh, can handle. And so, yeah, it's like, it's, it's the first time, you know, a category is simple to explain. It goes outside of technology and finance and thus uh, it, it is quite interesting. So yeah, f for me, the, the exponential growth since last summer was like a way of, of, of thinking this is the start of the, the chasm being crossed to early mainstream because for the first time, it's just not more about finance and technology anymore. It, it, like DeFi, DAOs, uh, Ethereum infrastructure, blockchain infrastructure, those are all like backend things, not consumer facing things. And so as a consumer founder, I was literally looking for a consumer use case for the past two years. And I was really excited to jump on this trend. Um, and actually, like even myself, like kind of underestimated it. I thought that it would be like roughly like 500 million volume by the end of this year, but I think it, it happened like in February or something. Like it was so fast. And so for me, yeah, it's a new social media primitive. Uh, it reminds me of social commerce apps in Asia, which the West did never really have any sort of equivalent. Uh, right? We have Instagram, but you don't buy anything from Instagram. Like the most equivalent in the West is like Fortnite skins. However, like we don't have like cheap enough transaction fees uh, for Fortnite skins type prices because it's always like at least a thousand dollars or more. Maybe Pinterest, I would say, is maybe the closest I feel because I know a lot of people use Pinterest to like to buy, you know, save. Yeah, like, you know, they're putting together like wish lit or like you know i i feel like maybe pinterest i know usually link to like products to buy as well wow. right yeah that makes sense so yeah P pinterest has some buying function but it's never as as easy like yeah like nft is like these the easiest thing to to buy something online i think like the it's like the alternative from web 2 is maybe like listing something on Shopify or ebay uh, nft is even easier 
it can be a hundred percent margin if you want. Once gas fees are like you know driving down to zero, uh, it can be a hundred percent. It's like it's entirely yours. Uh, there's there's so many benefits to to this uh, thing, and also you know like the blockchain space. We talk a lot about cryptocurrencies. NFTs, by definition, is everything else, right? Like NFTs, uh, like tokens are cryptocurrencies, the financial stuff. Everything else in this planet that is not fungible is everything is an NFT. And so I thought the market for it was pretty big. The white space is enormous for startups. It felt like a nice idea maze to go through. And so, yeah, for all of those reasons, I think, and, and especially me, like, I think looking back, I didn't even think about this when I started Showtime, but like, as a French tech outsider, quote unquote, like social media was my way of getting into tech. And so for me, going through the social media lens also made sense as well, because I've used social media. I know how to build those products. Social media also is good for word of mouth. And so, you know, for for a company to be successful, like I think their users has to talk to the to other people about it. And so it just felt to me like all the stars were aligning for, for Showtime uh, to to start and so the FC space is growing yeah we we just don't know that what will happen from here especially as like layer two solutions or new blockchains will arrive to scale up NFTs my guess is that it will be from digital art to all kinds of content whether it's photos videos memes podcasts newsletter all of those things will happen in the future and it's it's very interesting. So yeah, I'd like to maybe just bounce bounce on that to, to ask my next question is so I mean currently when you go to Showtime it, it looks very much like uh, like an Instagram right like it's a, a showcase of people's NFTs and there's some like sort of liking and commenting functionality but like what what is the future of Showtime like what kinds of things like you know in five years from now what would you like that platform to be to represent and you, know, you talked about newsletters and podcasts and things like that like where does that fit in in this uh, you know in the secret system sure um, so the, yeah there's, there's multiple features for showtime I think the five years one is the long term one and it is about creating a decentralized social network which means that right now you know because we wanted to move and build fast the only decentralized thing in Showtime are the NFTs, are the NFTs itself, right? Like the like, the comments, everything else is centralized so that we could move faster and build a product faster and see if people cared about it in the first place. And, and what we see is that as blockchain scales, we would put all of those interactions on chain uh, so that really your social identity that you own online with your crypto wallet can be used in any other front end that reads this like Showtime social graph infrastructure. Uh, so we will be the open social graph where any developer in the world can build a new platform on top of. So we can have like the newsletter Showtime, the podcast Showtime that will just literally see your followings, your followers, everything in one place. And so you don't have like right now, every new social media like Clubhouse, they had to start from zero. You had to start from zero people. And, and, what we did with Showtime was like, since we used the open NFT platform, we actually started Showtime with like dozens of thousands of accounts. And that felt great even to start a new social media because now crypto composability can be used to bootstrap a social graph from nothing. And there's so much hidden gems in blockchain data that we haven't utilized yet. And so we want to push this further with not just NFTs, which is like the very bare bone 2021 age to the 2025 age of like now all of your data is online it belongs to you any developer can serve you a platform and you know whichever one you choose uh they will make you pay a, a fee or something for their ux and maybe showtime the protocol will take a tiny fee on top of all of those but that seems like a much more you know like open world that we want to be in rather than all the tiny walled gardens that extract your content and like we know that story already Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. 
They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat, and they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. So, so open social graph, I mean, uh, this is a concept that I recently sort of became familiar with. Ben Thompson talks about this as well. And he talked about it like in the context of Clubhouse, which, you know, was like an interesting uh, thing that they did, which was just basically bootstrap their social graph by breaking uh, EU GDPR laws, but uh, potentially breaking EU GDPR laws. Yeah, maybe let's dive into this topic a little bit deeper. What, what's the open social graph and what does it enable uh, you know, that is fundamentally different from the current model of, you know, everybody has their own walled garden. I think what it enables is that like so many social platforms and communities cannot be enabled because the developers do not have access to the social graph. Like to build a new social media product, like it's probably better for you to work at Facebook and, and you know, try to lobby uh, the, the Facebook executives into like, oh, let's do this social media product. If you start a social media from scratch, well, maybe it's not economically viable for a small community. It won't be VC backed. Uh, and so what we, you, we, let, we end up with is like tons of very social media giants for verticals, but the innovation is constrained by the fact that like it, it's, you, you just cannot restart one that easily. Like you, you cannot plug on uh, the social graph. You cannot read uh, what, what like, the people want you to access. It's it's just really constrained. It constrains developer innovation. There is no developer sandbox for creating a social media. If the social graph was open, it would be much more. E- it would be just easier. And and sure, there is things like login with Facebook, and you know you you could do something like this. But it's like loading already content that is made and refactoring to like whatever UX you want is probably more powerful. And we haven't really seen anything like this yet. Like true composability, not just, okay, like starting with Facebook to like bootstrap your name and and your profile picture. Here it can be much bigger. You can discover new interactions with people that you didn't know were possible. And in the previous World Garden model, like you will have to first convince a bunch of people to sign with Facebook, go through your onboarding flow, so right now the setting with Facebook is just like a easy to like bootstrap this social graph versus here it's like one main one. And it just makes sense. Like this is how the internet should be. You should be able to own your data and owning your data was really theoretical for a long time. But now with NFTs, it makes more sense. It's like, okay, like you can make money from, from your data now. You can directly interact with people. You can express your support for someone much better than Web2, which was very altruistic based at most, like Patreon is donation based. And so anyway, my, my larger point is that innovation is being constrained uh, with, with wall gardens. This is probably why it would be better to have an open social graph. So how do you solve this in Showtime? So I actually like ran into this a little bit where like, you know, I, I opened up so- Showtime and, you know, I ha- was having trouble finding people that I already knew, right? Like I want to like follow my friends, but like, in Showtime, there's no way right now of like, you know, saying, oh, let me find my Twitter friends or something, right? I think right now, the only two people I'm following actually are <laughs> the two of you, actually, because uh, those are like the first, only two people I'm like, all right. I mean, I, I kind of like scrolled through a list of people. I'm like, okay, I don't know any of these people. So I just say, all right, well, I'm sure Alex has an account. Let me, I searched your name. Of course, you did. And I searched Sebastian's name. Of course, he did. But like, I wasn't sure how to find out which of my other friends also have accounts. And, and that's a bit hard because, um, you know, blockchain, like we are the first, amongst the first applications ever to try to make sense of blockchain data in a social way. Like we don't really, even if we have the Twitter API, like how can we know the ETH address? Like maybe if you have ENS in your username on Twitter, we would like resolve it and like searching on Showtime or stuff like this. Like it just is, we are starting this entire social data from scratch. The blockchain has zero social data. 
The blockchain has DeFi past history transactions, so you can maybe know if someone is like a, a good DeFi user or not, and if you sold a bunch of NFTs or not. But there's like we are trying to build it. Like we are trying to know. Actually, with the followers and following, like hopefully we'll get to to have a clearer uh, picture. And right now, I think if you've tried to follow some people, we will have like a, a, a nearest neighbor kind of algorithm trying to kind of detect like which people from like your second degree connections you might know and follow. But but that's about it for now. And uh, yeah, I do agree. Like we are starting this from scratch. This is why it looks a little bit like Pinterest or the early social media internet. Uh, you know, even Zora looks as a bit of this vibe. It's because we are recreating from scratch a little bit like those early social media platforms that had to start from yeah. scratch. So we honestly don't have that much data is my answer. And I'm not sure how to bridge login with Facebook and Twitter with true Ethereum addresses. Maybe by email because some people link with magic link by email. But yeah, it's still it's still not clear to me. Isn't this something you could use the graph for? Like, could you use the graph to build all of like these interactions between Ethereum addresses and usernames or whatever? So actually the graph is a, a team that we spoke a lot with, uh, basically every NFT team. I was part of, kind of when I started the undercategorized DeFi community, I also started this NFT subgraph community where like Zora, Rarible, everyone is in this group chat where we discuss how to do the NFT standard. And so maybe, yeah, as part of the standard, um, we could maybe have some things where it could link to your social accounts or to like your email address or something that could be curated and we can then use to kind of track your friends if you log in with like social logins like Twitter and, and see your friends. That would make sense. Yeah. But so just coming back to the social graph, this open social graph idea. So I, I think it's a really cool idea to, to want to bootstrap this this sort of thing. I wonder though, in you know, if with 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 the ambitions that you have of like creating this open social graph, the way I see it is like Showtimes becomes sort of an open platform, and anyone can build like a, a podcast network on top of it, or you know, a, a newsletter platform, or like whatever you know, new type of content platforms would exist in the future. You would use Showtime to do that. Um, you, know, you could use Showtime as one of the platforms on which you do that. And there might be other social graphs that exist and you may have like interoperability. So like I sort of see this vision for like, you know, this um, social application platform, basically, like sort of thing. But uh, wh why did you choose sort of crypto art as the, the starting point for this? Because like if you're going to try to reach like the mainstream audiences, it feels to me like you'd want to go with something that's more mainstream, like podcasts or newsletters or like, you know, sharing pictures of your, your, your brunch or whatever. So yeah, why, why crypto art? And you know, wh where do you, where do you start sort of bridging into these more mainstream use cases uh, that aren't reserved to like, you know, crypto whales or like people with a lot of crypto that can buy NFTs? So from the NFT world, uh, you know, from the crypto native perspective, it seemed like crypto art was the most popular one, the most decentralized one, like we see NBA Top Shots as well, or like Genies, which are applications on Flow, this other blockchain where they have B2B deals with very famous people or, or, or leagues. And so we were like, okay, like in the decentralized Ethereum world, which will be better to start an open social graph than another blockchain, um, it seems like the most popular consumer use case is um, digital art. And the second thing that went through the decision was you know, digital art is visual content. And so I'm not saying we will successfully, you know, achieve this transition, but what also is visual content is things like Instagram or TikTok, which are extremely consumer facing and very mainstream and, you know, uh, 1 billion plus users. And so it seems like with layer two and other solutions, Showtime could scale to expand from digital art to any videos, photos, memes, the same way that Instagram started with like your friends drinking coffee to like this influencer platform now, uh, we think we can maybe bridge from the creator, uh, you know, the digital artist as a beachhead to a bigger market afterwards. And hopefully crypto infrastructure will scale so that we can enable those things. Right now, digital art is just the only economically viable thing you can do. This, like, there's not much other things unless you start, 
your own, you know, like proof of stake, uh, you know, blockchain or sidechain, like this little other use cases than digital art right now. But I think it can bridge to something else because it's the same visual content formats. So like the UX that we're building can be reused for other use cases. So yeah, this is why. And then, yeah, like something like newsletter or podcast, like there is no other, uh, there is no newsletter NFT. Well, there is Mirror, I guess, in some ways, and they're doing a wonderful job. And, uh, but that's, that's about it. Like there's no, there's no newsletter. Uh, there's no YouTube NFTs for like longer videos. All of those new formats, I think are companies worth starting, but crypto is maybe too early for this because it's maybe too heavy files or maybe there's just not enough data like newsletter. No one is doing newsletter right now. Like, so, like digital art is here. It's on the blockchain. It's just for us to take and, you know, display and, and put into this visual content. So to start like a, a social media protocol, reverse engineering it, it seemed like visual content is like a massive, massive part of social media. And digital art is that one category that is in this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in this format. So that's the rational. Uh, but I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it will be, um, it will be different uh, and should will be used for not just digital art, but another niche and we maybe won't bridge the mainstream I'm not sure. Um, it's, yeah, I think like, you know, maybe there's some digital art platform that, you know, are started by artists or, you, you know, really want to remain artists first, but we really have this more general vision in the future. And so we would like to appeal beyond art. Art is just the first step. So how does uh, Showtime sort of compare to like, you know, there's, I, I know there's like other similar projects like Zora and Foundation and things like that. Or like, why would I even use Showtime as opposed to like OpenSea, right? Like you can go to my profile page on OpenSea and you can kind of see the somewhat similar information. They have a like button as well. So what, what's sort of the difference here? So I would say uh, OpenSea is best at being very exhaustive in features indexing the NFTs, indexing all the attributes, uh, really making sure that you can see all the collections. Um, and so it seems like it's a different use case. I would say like OpenSea is more the eBay or the Amazon of NFTs, you know, that shows the price, like really does show everything and is like the base layer, like the ethers kind of NFTs. And, and Showtime is more like we are making opinionated UX uh, decisions to make it just like something that you browse, uh, you know, more casually that you can see, you know, your friends NFT, you can see your friends brag with that NFTs, but yeah, it, it's more of like showing your portfolio to the public. Uh, OpenSea is more like, okay, like detecting every single NFT, like which one is on sale, which one is a bit, et cetera. So I would say it's a, uh, it's a different like we could go into a pensy direction, but it would make our design like just more cluttered and less appealing. And OpenSea could reduce some features to be more like Showtime, but also they would miss out on some key features of their NFT search engine that they spent years building. So it seems like we are different enough. And both are required, honestly. Like, you know, a lot of NFTs on Showtime, we have this button like, you know, view on OpenSea if you want to have more, more data or information about the NFT. So I feel like we're still quite different. And then, you know, foundation, uh, I guess foundation could be like right now it's like one gallery for NFT, like one auction house. And so maybe foundation will be like a very popular account on short time in the future. I'm not sure exactly how they will evolve. And, and who else? Well, Zora is very interesting because it feels like Zora is perhaps leading the NFT standard and if we ever have to do our own marketplaces feature, uh, we may use the NFTs from Zora because it seems like it's a standard that they're improving a lot and that has more features that is composable with other things like Mirror is building uh, things to like split royalties from, from Zora NFTs. And so Zora, I believe like we are completely complementary with them and it's, it's very likely that we will use their uh, at least integrate uh, at best use for our own marketplaces features. So I think we're like the layer on top of Zora. Zora is the content primitive. We are like the social graph, like, you know, interaction primitive. One of the things I was actually thinking about last night uh, is, do you know if there's any like platform for like, I, I was thinking about this in like terms of like fantasy sports, like, 
do you think there's something with like fantasy art where it's like I, I mean I was thinking of like you know can you create derivatives of NFTs where it's like hey I want to bet on the next Beeple artwork and how much it's going the next sale is going to go for and I want to create like a derivative on that and like and I was like oh I want to put together this like fantasy art game where I can like you know create my team of artists against your team of artists or something like that do you know if anyone's working on something like that yeah, so like fantasy as in like, you know, you create your outlier own game and like your goal is to uh, beat other people in a, a game fashion that it doesn't have yeah. like the real value. Yeah, there is like Sorare, which is this French company who does this with soccer clubs. There's also this new startup I just heard of like last week called Vision Rare, which is fantasy startups. So like even if you're not a VC, you can create your outlier like startup portfolio and maybe that will help you break into VCs. Because VCs will just see like, oh, wow, like you got into this company in this fantasy game like super early on. Uh, anyways, for Showtime, I feel like, yeah, like betting on someone early is something that obviously like as myself who like created the Alex token, but people could bet on myself early. Uh, and it seems so far to be paying off for them. Like, uh, you know, having created one of the first creator tokens, like it really makes me wonder uh, whether we should do it on Showtime. I can't talk too much about this, but like... Uh, we're going to probably do something where, you know, you can, you can maybe bet on creators or collectors in the future. Mm-hmm. And, and that should be something that you'll, you'll hear more about soon. How, you know, can you tell us a bit about like the team and the company and like, you know, how are you guys Is there going to be a show token or something or like what's the long-term like roadmap of this? For sure. So, um, so the team, we are a team of six. Most engineering right now, the phase of showtime is really like building. Like we have a lot of things to build. We have, you know, maybe like scaling and, and layer two solutions is something that we're thinking about right now so that really we can then do a push on marketing once the product is, is fully finished. Although right now, marketing wise, it's doing pretty well. It seems like creators and collectors love the showtime account. They, they, whenever they are on, on our trending page, they, they share it and people follow each other. So it seems, it seems exciting for now. So since our vision is a um, social media protocol, uh, it won't be an IPO, uh, but it will probably be a, a token offering. Uh, although I cannot say anything. I feel like I'm so scared of, of, of like saying things. We, we just don't know right now. Like this is the very start of Showtime, but it's, it's something that we are potentially uh, interested in. And it seems like the natural way of creating a social media protocol. Like it cannot be a, a C Corp like IPOing. Uh, the, the traditional business way. So it will be a protocol that probably will be a token. Like this, it's something that we're really interested about, but it's too early to call, right? It's like when you are a startup that's five months old and just going to Y Combinator, you don't think about the IPO. I think it's the same stage right now for us. Like we just got started. I think thinking about a token is too early, but it seems like it's the right approach. Seeing all of those DeFi projects get coined more recently, it seems like it's the best way to decentralize your protocol and and make sure that everyone who participates in the value is getting fairly compensated for, for their work. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, like you mentioned, you're, you're pretty early stage still, you guys recently raised funding, uh, you know, and I think paradigm was your lead investor. And so, you know, paradigm is like, you know, a really well-known fund in the space, but they've always like really been more on the DeFi uh, side of things. Um, And so I feel like this is one of their like first forays into this like NFT thing. And so like, what was their whole, like, what did you do to like pitch them and get them excited about NFTs? Um, yeah, I'm laughing because I am absolutely terrible at pitching. <laughs> I, I feel like it was more because, you know, Showtime, like we launched very fast and we, you know, built as quickly as we can. And I think that was what built up their conviction rather than my storytelling skills. And yeah, like, I mean, Paradigm, yeah, actually this is very true. Paradigm uh, historically only funded DeFi projects. And, and redo really like, you know, AMM deep research, like participated to like you have V3 designs. And so why would they fund an NFT project? Well, first of all, uh, it was because NFTs were not that important until like very recently, one. And two, they actually funded Zora pretty recently as well. It seems like Zora could be complementary to us because they are doing the content primitive. We are the social primitive, the curation primitive, you know. And so there's a lot of, improvements on top of this very bare bone NFT structure that their crypto expertise could be very useful. First to bridge like, you know, layer two solution and to scale, 
paired up with like Georgios or or other team members will be very useful. Uh, but also, you know, maybe doing some smart contract changes, uh, communicating with the Zora team around like what are the latest uh, things that you can build on top of NFTs. I think they will be quite helpful in that realm. So yes, it's true. NFTs is something that is very new for Paradigm, but it's also very new for crypto as a whole. And I think their expertise will be very much needed because the NFT standard, to be honest, right now is, is too simple. We have to build a bunch of other things. We have to build a social media protocol in the next few years. And so a lot of research will be needed to just implement it. And um, this is why we kind of uh, chose them as partners. It seems like at our stage, they are the best partners we can ask for. So taking a, a bit of a step back here and, and zooming out and looking at the so the NFT space, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges you think that the ecosystem faces today? You know, whether it's in terms of you know infrastructure, scalability, you know, dev tools, or just kind of general use cases and applications. Uh, I, I feel like in a lot of ways we're like things here, things in this NFT craze are sort of a little, a little bit similar to you know, how things were in the ICO uh, boom of 2017, 2018. And, you know, in the end, like once the dust settles, there will be like a sort of like a new normal. Uh, so what what are the challenges right now? And then maybe like to a follow-up question is like, when the dust settles, what, 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 what will the ecosystem look like? For sure. That makes sense. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, the ICO craze, obviously like uh, mostly scams, no dev tools, uh, no no apps or the apps to plug in um, and no infrastructure like blockchain was still like very nascent. I feel like this, this time around uh, there is better dev tools. There is also a uh, better infrastructure. Like, well, mainnet is still very bad of course, and like not scalable, but it's, it's a problem that's like almost technologically solved, right? Because of layer two solutions coming out very, very soon this summer and a bunch of new improvements with Ethereum 2, like it, it seems like infrastructure is about to be solved. Dev tools are much better. There are applications already. So I feel like just waiting those few next months and we'll see the NFT space probably really, really boom in popularity. And so what comes out of this after the scalability gap is formed and also fiat on ramp and fiat off ramp and, you know, mainstream wallets via emails, you know, like with layer two, you can also do like the smart contract wallet vision much better. Right now, you know, SparkTalk wallets is not really doable on, on mainnet. I think like, you know, uh, Arjun, which is amazing pioneers, like they struggle subsidizing the gas fees, of course, and things like this. And so a lot of uh, tooling with layer two become ready for the mainstream. Seattle Ram becomes ready. And so what will emerge from this is an explosion of social apps. And social apps are amazing at propagating word of mouth. And so that will be obviously very huge for the entire crypto space because when you're on Showtime, you start making money. Well, we can plug, you know, USDC trading on Uniswap and, you know, frame it as savings accounts. If it's insured on Open, for instance, like we can do some complex DeFi products that we can then in our UI tell, you know, Showtime users. So basically uh, a new wave of social media, a new wave of consumer facing DeFi products uh, like a web free portal type apps, that all of this will be available. And so we just need scalability and fiat on ramp in my mind. Most of the other things are are done. We're just waiting for, you know, like optimism is very exciting, stockware is very exciting, Arbitrum, Ethereum to a lot of those things like will be very, very soon released. And that's for me the main blocker. This will unleash a lot of innovation. And so actually I actually think the cycle will be even shorter. Like it took two years to build, to build a bunch of stuff. This cycle, like sure, NFT volume has decreased a little bit, but like qu very quickly, maybe this summer, a lot of layer two solution will just create so much more new use cases for NFTs that are not possible before. Uh, and also like, you know, more capital efficient DeFi as well, that uh, the bull market will quickly resume. <laughs> one, one other thing I, I've been thinking about here, and it's it's basically so... You know, there, I think there's like two types of tokens in the space, right? You like native tokens that exist on chain and like their, their value is represented solely by their on chain representation. And so, you know, uh, DeFi governance tokens, you know, uh, stable coins, crypto art NFTs are part of this category. And then you have like tokenized assets. And so you have like uh, tokenized, you know, USD in the form of USDC. 
And for NFTs, a lot of people um, who, who have entered the space have been thinking about like tokenizing physical art and like things that don't exist uh, on a blockchain uh, or like that don't exist in, in the digital realm. Do you think that this is, do you think that there's actual value here? Do you think this is actually a use case or is it just sort of like this exuberance that people like just want to build NFTs out of everything and like there's not really anything behind it? Like what, what, what do you think of like this tokenized physical asset being tokenized as an NFT? I think this is this is good. Like um, it, it seems like NFT could be the standard for all things, like a ledger of of everything, like a universal receipt. Um, I, I do agree with your point that well, I'm not sure if it was uh, you know framed as a point, but it seems to me that like you know crypto is still very early, digital scales much better. So it seems like the market for physical based NFTs is basically smaller and uh, less important, but yeah, I, I do think that NFTs could be the, the universal ledger of the world. And so it means that physical art could have, you know, their inception date or royalties or whatever thing, like at least encoded in a blockchain and, and, and paid in a blockchain, like, you know, virtual real estate. All of those things will bring much more liquidity and access, right? Anyone with the internet connection could like, you know, purchase a, a, a part of some real estate somewhere like Realty is doing with real estate. It just seems like to me, those are one, a little bit smaller markets and they scale not as fast because you need to have the custody part and all the meat space, uh, you know, constraints. So no, I think this is interesting. Uh, digital scales better. That's just the way things are like, you know, and, and to have like a physical... Uh, space really winning, like you have to be really perfect at logistics, kind of like Amazon is, right? That Like they are mid-space, but like they are so incredibly talented at logistics. So maybe some operations like Amazon grade of excellence in the physical world will be required to have like a very big uh, idea plan out. Otherwise, I think first we'll hear a lot about uh, digital before then the physical can take place. I think that a lot of the physical NFT stuff will probably fizzle out. And so I guess like with my follow-up question here and maybe you know we can we can end on this is what do you what do you expect the killer app to be here and with any new technology I feel like most times someone's getting disrupted. So, so, someone will win like there are winners and losers basically like in this in in this uh in this craze and like so in the in the long term once the sort of NFT killer app uh, emerges, like who, what would that be? Who will be the winners and like who will get disrupted or who will be the losers? So it, it seems like the winners will definitely be uh, the one building in the NFT space today. A little bit like, you know, DeFi is on its way to win and the losers are basically banking because a big chunk of their business is gone and then they will probably be forced to pivot to become like, you know, DeFi front ends. And same for the NFT space, it feels like NFT space is probably going to eat social media. And so when you can make money online, social media and e-commerce, I guess, are like the, the incumbents there probably will have a very hard time competing with the ease of transaction, royalties giving, uh, just like the general fees of the applications are just so much lower. Everything will be more capital efficient. The transfer will be uh, global. And, and also like, Compatibility is such a big thing, right? Like you can build one component really well, everyone can build on top of you. And so we can create really complex social media interactions that Facebook will struggle to compete with. So I would say Facebook, uh, you know, Facebook is one cool social media app away of being disrupted. I think out of all the Fang CEOs, like he's, Mark Zuckerberg is probably the one that sleeps the less at night, I guess, because it's it's hard. Yeah, that, that and boomers getting older. <laughs> <laughs> and boomers are getting older and, and those are the main ones using Facebook. And I guess Instagram is like, you know, actually like every social media has this kind of curve of like the peak and then it just goes down and, and Instagram is on, t is on its way down. Uh, I think the peak of Instagram was 2019. TikTok is basically going through their peak right now and it will also go down. And, and Clubhouse, totally to tell, but Clubhouse seems like to be a, a great success and I wish them the best. But basically, yeah, it seems like uh, a few social media giants are going slightly down and who are the ones who are going to take over? It, they, they most likely will be crypto-based 
Uh, maybe in Asia, there will be some centralized social commerce service that could be a little bit similar to NFTs in a centralized manner. But, but I think in the Western world, at least, NFT platforms, uh, yeah, for me, social media apps where, you know, instead of Instagram or YouTube taking all of your money and sending it to advertisers, like what I, what I envision is like your, your picture that you upload, like if you're a famous influencer, like this will be an NFT that like uh, an advertiser will directly buy. So like no more middlemen, like you directly like sponsored by on Instagram would become like owned, collected by Coca-Cola that will then, you know, buy themselves the advertising rights on your popular social media content. And they can even buy it in maybe Coca-Cola tokens. That will be a coupon for, you know, uh, buying Coca-Cola. Like you can still convert to Fiat on Uniswap, but Coca-Cola, it will just buy more products of Coca-Cola. And to continue with that metaphor, maybe there will be a way from the creator to like flow down some of its profits in Coca-Cola tokens to the users. So basically there is no more advertising here because like you directly as a user benefit from the money spent in advertising. Like there is no advertising is basically like a middleman between like a product and their audience with tokens and crypto. You can directly bridge to the users and there will be some fees obviously to maintain like short time and other things, but they will be minimal. Uh, and so that's very exciting. So to me, this is what it feels like. Like crypto will be better than free products, meaning that you will get literally paid for, for doing actions online, even as a user. It enables so many more things that Facebook just cannot do because Facebook either uh, is, is as so much infrastructure debt as is too centralized. And so that's a liability with the governments and regulations coming after them. So too many hurdles. Obviously, I'm sure Facebook is a very smart team. They're going to pivot to, you know, hardware uh, with like, um, you know, VR. Maybe that's like their way of like escaping and, and knowing that they will lose this battle. But it feels like social media is going to be reinvented and it's going to be uh, the NFT startups that, that win. Speaking of VR, like how important do you think uh, VR will be to like the success of NFTs? Because I feel like especially when I pitch NFTs to like normies, I feel they don't get it until I start talking about VR and the metaverse. And then they're like, oh, okay, you're right. This makes sense. I, I totally agree. This is very interesting. I think normies don't, do not get NFTs today because there is no social layer. And so it feels like you're buying something. The reason the argument like, oh, it's just a JPEG kind of makes sense for a normie is because there is no way to showcase your NFTs anywhere. So Showtime is the first answer to this. But obviously the long-term vision is the metaverse. And so the metaverse like has to be economically independent. Otherwise it's very dystopian. So we don't want Facebook to own your entire economy just because, well, that's very bad. They will see literally all your interactions and your data uh, and they will own this in the world garden fashion. That's pretty bad. And two, because the, probably the fees will be higher as well. They will just impose their own fees and be like a monopoly of data and also of like the fees. And so that's pretty bad. And so, yeah, like for the VR metaverse to exist, we need, so VR obviously, and also cryptocurrencies, um, NFTs as like a real estate space in, in a world, right? Where now if you work, play, live in this VR world, well, now your NFT has much more utility, right? Everyone in the world can see it. Everyone in the world can trade it. It seems like, yeah, NFTs are, as of today, because digital scales more than the physical world, and they probably will be always more popular in the digital world than the physical world. It makes sense that NFTs are really well uh, suited for, for the metaverse. And so it, it makes more sense for people to understand this vision and this will probably be like, you know, slowly sweeping through our lives and people will understand NFTs more. Uh, and yeah, open worlds, you know, are kind of pioneering this. Uh, Decentraland, CryptoVox, Sandbox, all of those projects with NFTs as real estate. And there's like metaverse preppers, which is like a kind of funny category of people who like already start buying so much land. So they will be like the rich landlords of this new universe stocking up on canned goods and stuff <laughs> that's that's very really funny so definitely yeah metaverse vr plus crypto makes all sense we need both technologies to work out mm -hmm. um and it seems like it'll be the case in 10 years time 15 years time and that'll be very exciting 
Yeah, that's a very actually interesting way of, pl- of positioning. And I feel it's like, you know, the reason I think why people understand the VR side is for saying, okay, this is how I display my NFTs. But now what you're saying is with Showtime, like even pre-VR, if you have a way of sh- displaying NFTs, then that will get help. Yeah, Showtime is pre-VR it. because all world right now is pre-VR. Like all world is still Instagram right. slash TikTok. We don't have a VR headset that is very cheap. Um, it doesn't exactly replace your phone. So like there's like a ton of things that like are needed for VR. There's a cool project called yeah. Unai mm-hmm. that's backed by Naval, pretty cool French founder as well. And yeah, like it's trying to do like a social media VR headset. We'll see where it goes and I'd be happy to look into it. But so far, Showtime is built for the pre-VR world. Like we have enough work to do with crypto alone to then think about VR and we'll see if we can plug to VR th- things, but shouldn't be too hard, honestly. Like it's a social media protocol, like the VR headset can just like read that data under a different UX and that will be like the metaverse. Cool, Alex, uh, we'll have to end it there. But thanks so much for coming on the podcast and uh, sharing your vision for Showtime and for the, the open uh, social graph and the NFT space. It's been really fascinating. Where do people find you? What's your Showtime handle that we, people should My Showtime up? handle is at AM because my co-founder is also called Alex. Uh, so he got the Alex one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so try Showtime.com slash AM. And then my Twitter is at Alex Masmej. And that's where like I basically live right now. That's like my metaverse right now as of today. <laughs> Showtime and Twitter. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.